And good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us here for our fourth NGPA COVID-19 member resource webinar. Uh, my name is Brian Gambino and I'm the president of the NGPA and I'm coming to you live from my home here in Chicago, Illinois. I hope you are uh, all healthy and well and uh, keeping as positive as you can during this uh, rough time in our world's history. Um, here at the NGPA over the past five weeks, uh, we've been teaming up with our corporate sponsors, our industry partners, and our organizational allies to bring you webinar content that's very appropriate for the worldwide situation that we're all going through. We started our webinar series with medical guidance from Dr. Quay Snyder, continued onward with financial planning advice from Todd Foster, and our latest webinar was on aviation job market perspective and advice from Angie Marshall and Cheryl Cage at Cage Marshall Consulting. If you missed any or all of those, you can still check out all of them in their entirety by navigating to our COVID-19 member resources page of www.ngpa.org. Um, and if you wanna take them on the go with you, we've made it even easier as they've been converted into podcasts, um, which you can download and you can find by searching NGPA Podcast on Apple Music, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. For today's webinar, uh, we're gonna run it in the same format as our previous ones. For those of you who haven't joined us before though, this is exactly what you can expect. I'll be turning it over shortly to our featured guests for their presentation. And after that presentation, we're gonna to go to a live question and answer session. If you take a look at the bottom of your screen right now, you will notice you have a raise hand function as well as a chat function. Once we open up the question and answer at the end of the presentation, um, I'll remind you all of this. And if you'd like to ask a question live, you'll be able to click the raise your hand button and then I'll call on you in order that we have your uh, hands raised for questions to our guests. Um, our moderator, Luke, will unmute your computer's microphone, and I'll call on you directly to answer your question live in real time. Uh, for those of you who don't wish to speak your question live, if maybe you're a little bit more shy, no problem with that, feel free to use the chat function and ask your question in the chat box. Uh, we'll all see it on our side, and we'll ask it directly to our panelists for you. So for today's webinar, it's called How Flying Builds Habits for Success. The NGPA is truly delighted to have joining us two absolute icons in the, aviation, uh, in the aviation industry. Um, it's obviously the delightful and charming John and Martha King. John and Martha's passion for aviation spans decades and decades. After a not so successful business venture in the 1970s, John and Martha began to teach what their passion was, and that was flying. After over 10 years of doing live flying seminars, they decided to put those seminars into video form. And with that, they began to revolutionize the flight training industry. Out of the spare bedroom of their home, John and Martha built from the ground up what has now become a flight training brand known to the world as King Schools Inc. John and Martha have put out millions of video aviation courses, which have been translated into almost every language and they've been disseminated across the world. Through their witty, fun-loving, and humorous training videos, John and Martha have taught more pilots than anyone in the history of aviation, and that's quite a feat. Outside of their business with King Schools, they both still remain active and current in many categories of aircraft, flying everything from jets to pistons to helicopters, and uh, a chat that we just had before we started this webinar, lighter than airs, as they, are, uh, they sometimes pilot the Fujifilm blimp um, over some different events and whatnot. Their warm and welcoming demeanor surely captures the attention of anyone they come in contact with. And the NGPA was lucky enough to welcome them to our flagship winter warm up and industry expo event out in Palm Springs, California, back in 2019, where John and Martha made presentations to our expo attendees, many of which uh, you may have seen already, um, and all of our members as well throughout our event weekend. They got to know our organization very well as they spent the entire weekend with us. And here at the NGPA, we are so proud to call them fierce allies of our LGBTQ aviation community. So enough for me, I know that's not what you're here for. Without further delay, I'd like to hand it off to San Diego, California to speak to our teachers, our mentors and friends in aviation. Thank you so much for being with us. John and Martha, it's your show. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Folks, in case there's any confusion about this, I'm John Kay. <laughs> and I'm Martha King. And, and it's really wonderful to be with you here again. If we saw you in Palm Springs, welcome uh, back. And, and if not, well, it's good to, to virtually meet you today. Well, we have an enormous amount of respect for you, and it's a great pleasure to talk with you today. And we're going to talk about um, our having gone broke, and, and then we got not broke. And we're going to talk about what we learned uh, from those two experiences. By the way, we like not broke a lot better. An awful lot better. Uh, like, like many of you, uh, maybe most of you, John and I have spent a lifetime in aviation and we've got a real passion about flying and about pilots. And 
Uh, we started out doing, uh, and we're going to talk a lot more about this later on, but we started out doing two-day traveling ground schools uh, in the business that we did like. And it, part of the reason we probably went broke in our earlier business, the one that Brian alluded to, is because we were spending all of our time and money flying instead of running a business. So um, I, like a lot of pilots, we've always uh, lusted after a little bit more airplane than we could really afford to fly. And when we uh, got into the two-day ground school business, we bought a Cessna 340, a twin engine, cabin class, a Cessna twin, and we really loved that. It was a, a fabulous airplane to use as we traveled around to different cities doing the two-day live weekend ground schools. We, um, but you know, with every pilot, after you've flown any one particular plane long enough, you seems like you always get this driving need for uh, more power, more speed, and well, we were doing pretty well until we got that illness. Oh, I know it was a terrible illness, it, it a very expensive illness. We had this horrible need to smell jet fuel. So we went out and we bought a, a old Cessna Citation, a Citation 500. We used to call it a Citation Zero. It was one of the very first business jets that were ever built, Cessna built it of course, and it was before they started numbering the Citations, one and two and three and so on. So we called it a Zero. Uh, but it was, it was a really nice airplane, a great step up for us from the Cessna 340 we'd been flying before. But then we got the sickness again, and we needed more, more speed, more range, more altitude. Well, Martha, the problem with that old citation is, and not only was it one of the first business jets, it was the, one of the slowest jets ever built. Well, you're right, John. I, I was trying to kind of omit that from my memory no, and then no. pass that it by. Was, it was slow. Oh, yeah. well, they used to call it a slotation. And there were all sorts of terrible nicknames for it. They, they called it a crustacean. They called it a mutation. Um, uh, the air traffic controllers used to always move us out of the way for the real jets, the airliners, to go by. And, um, so they called it a frustration. They called it a frustration. And you know that Citation 500 had a really bad, unusual bird strike problem. You know what the problem with that was, John? You remember? I think you're going to tell me, Martha. Well, it got run down from the rear. That's now. That's a bad bird strike. Problem. That's a bad bird strike. Well, they problem. used to. They used to use it. The Beechcraft used to use it in their ads, didn't they? They did. Their Beechcraft ads for the King Air used to say, uh, "This uh, uh, King Air flies at near jet speeds," and the Citation 500 was the near jet they were talking about. So we had that uh, old Citation for about ten years. We put up with all these jokes at our expense. And finally, we just decided that we wanted something faster. So we went out and bought the old Falcon 10 that we have now. And that Falcon 10 is 150 knots faster than the Citation. Um, so as you can imagine, the insurance company had grave misgivings about this idea of this mom and pop operation flying a hot jet. So they said, look, John and Martha, in addition to going out and getting type rated in this aircraft, we want to make sure that you take the full two week course of simulator training. So we went out and we took the simulator training course. And, and I'll tell you, it was just about the hardest work we ever did in our lives. We just sweated bullets. We were exhausted. But when we got done, we figured we must have done pretty well because the instructor got us aside and he says, John, Martha, I've got wonderful news for you. And I said, well, that's fantastic. What's that? He says, well, you'll never have to worry about a mid-air collision in this airplane. And I said, that's wonderful. Why not? He says, you're so far behind this airplane, you won't even be involved. He says, you're going to come walking up to the crash site some 15 minutes later and go, what happened here? So 
Uh, Martha and I have been flying together all of these years, and, and I have to make it clear. I want to make this very clear. Martha's just a little bit better pilot than I am. And so people often say to me, uh, John, you're, you're fortunate, but lucky that Martha will fly with you. I say, lucky? What are you talking about lucky? She wants to fly half, half the time. Uh, it costs twice as much to be current, and she's got an opinion about everything. You know, John likes to think that our relationship exemplifies that old saying that behind every successful man stands a great woman. Well, you got that right, Martha. That's exactly how I feel about it. What he doesn't realize is the real saying is in front of every great woman stands some guy without a clue who's blocking her view. <laughs> well, folks, what we hope to accomplish today is we hope to give you some insights and tools that will make everything a lot more fun and and give you the satisfaction of having a bigger, more positive influence in the lives that you come in, of people you come into contact with. In other words, it's gonna make everything better in your life. And that sounds like a, a tall order, uh, and it is a tall order. Um, so uh, make more fun, get more satisfaction, have a better influence on all those you come in contact with. So what we're going to reveal right here this afternoon is first of all the single most important consideration in getting ahead in life and secondly the dynamite tool that gets results from other people every time now this is a picture you're going to enjoy well martha and i have been broke and not broke we actually never got down to wearing a barrel but we uh we did get this down and out and uh, uh, so our, and, a, and one of the reasons we went broke is this is the business we were in and, and we weren't, Martha didn't really wear a dress while she checked the air and tires, but what we were in a business of servicing vehicles, we serviced trucks, uh, fleets and trucks. And the problem is we didn't enjoy it. We weren't having a good time. There was nothing about that business that we liked. And when you're not having a good time, you don't work as hard. You don't persist through difficulty. And ultimately, we just gave up on the business and, and decided we wanted to do something that was a lot more fun. Right. It was not a formula for success. So we went broke in that business, actually bankrupt in it. And we looked at each other and said, that hurt. Let's not do that again. And we decided that we'd just go out and do something for the fun of it for a while uh, while we looked around for a serious business. And what we did for the fun of it is we started teaching two-day ground schools. Now, we didn't start out with this Cessna 340 you see behind us here, but uh, eventually the business provided us with that, which made flying around to the uh, different cities where we did the two-day live ground schools a, a lot more fun <clears throat> and a lot more practical. So we, we had said to ourselves, when we were in the previous business, we were trying to make a home run. Let's, let's do something big and ambitious and, and get a home run. And when we got into the two-day ground school business, we said, well, we don't want to, let, let's quit swinging for the fences and just do something for the fun of it for a while. But the advantage of doing something that we really had a passion about, and we had a passion about aviation and had had during our previous business, probably, as I said, part of the reason why we went broke, is that we really had a passion for aviation. So we spent a lot of time studying it and getting better at it. And uh, we were willing to work really hard and do whatever it took uh, to make it work. And we flew around uh, the country, particularly the western part of the country, teaching these live two-day ground schools. And uh, part of what we did in the beginning, old-fashioned technology, and I apologize for the quality of this picture, but we would have overhead projectors and we would put uh, transparencies on them to illustrate the concepts that we were talking about uh, in that particular part of the course. Well, about the early 1980s, a video came out. So we 
put segments of these classes on video, and here is, am I in the front of the classroom um, uh, teaching uh, on video, and the people that are in the classroom are watching the video. And so that's how we got started in the video. We used it in our classroom, and we sent teams of instructors around with videos, and they played the videos, and Martha and I taught the classes even though we weren't there. And so we had uh, several classrooms going every weekend at a time with uh, uh, instructors who just went out and uh, played the videos and, and, and talked to the people and worked, dealt with them. Worked with and, them on questions and stuff like that, yeah. And then as video came in more and more, as people got uh, VHS recorders uh, at home and players, we started putting our courses on video and shipping them out to people. And, and what we had done by doing this is basically we had a product now that we could send out and we didn't even have to have teams of instructors. We could sell it to people uh, and, and ship it out from our uh, business location. And, and this is the shot in the studio. And as you can see, ultimately we became a little bit more sophisticated and um, and uh, is it, they, we had what, what, what they called what we called blue screen technology, where you could key something in behind you, so we could be standing in front of this blue wall. But what you saw in the video was us in front of an airplane or in front of a sectional chart like this. So here I am, here I am teaching in front of a sectional chart. I'm actually I'm standing in front of that blue wall that you saw there earlier. So we we got a lot of capability of of uh, teaching that way, and. Uh, became a pretty powerful tool. But one of the things that happened about video uh, is that it, it let us scale the business. Instead of having to be physically in the classroom, being in, uh, 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 putting our courses on uh, video meant that we could come in people's living rooms and teach them in their living rooms. So it let us multiply out the business quite a bit. And eventually, because we were selling enough videos to enough people all around the country and indeed all around the world, uh, we were able to, to buy a Cessna Citation and then eventually this old, old Falcon 10 that we've been flying now for 18 years, 18 yeah, years yeah, yeah. a long time. Yeah. And we've thought about why we went from being an abject failure in the previous business to, to being what we consider a wonderful success because it's given us a life in aviation and the ability to do a lot of flying. And in our opinion, the difference is having fun. We really enjoy flying, as I said, and we have ever since we started flying. And when we started teaching knowledge courses, um, we made sure that we could fly ourselves to the classes. We started in, in a, flying a Cherokee 140 and then a 210 and then a Cessna 310 and then a Cessna 340. And um, the citation only came once we got on video and were uh, shipping products out. But one, one of the things you can say is we have a passion for teaching and we really, really like teaching uh, aviation. And that means we're willing to work harder, persist through uh, difficulties better. And uh, so that passion for flying and passion, passion for teaching flying is probably the biggest reason we were able to eat regularly in aviation. We, right. we've, we've been now uh, some 46 years in aviation and, uh, and teaching aviation. And people say, well, how come you're still eating regularly? Well, one of the reasons we're eating regularly is we uh, really, really care about what we're doing, and we solicit feedback from our customers and, and, and really are responsive to it. And the other thing is, is in addition to the aviation, we've kept, kept up with technology, and, and uh, that, keeping up with technology has let us scale the business. We'll talk more about that later. And one of the things the business has done for us is and to help our success is it's given us the opportunity to meet and become friends with a lot of successful business people. Because when you find out that someone else is a pilot, it doesn't matter uh, what they do or what you do uh, in the real world for real living. You, you have a connection there and people are willing to spend time with you and and to mentor you and work with you to help you be more successful. So we had the opportunity to um, 
uh, start working with uh, learning from a lot of other people in business. These aviation connections have been very deep connections that we've had with a lot of people and we've learned a lot from the people that we've had those connections with. And one of the things uh, that we feel that we have learned is some of the secrets of success. Some of these, some of these people who became friends of ours in, in uh, business are billionaires. And, and we woke up and realized that not too long ago, well, we know a lot of people that are billionaires. And it's, and it's because aviation selects people who have done very, very well. And I also think aviation, we're gonna talk later about it. I think aviation helps people do well. It's, it's um, it, it, if you, the, the kind of person you become as a result of aviation, uh, helps you do well. So, so we, we had the opportunity to meet and become friends with a lot of special people and, and, we've, and we have learned from them. One of the things that, um, that we've learned is that if you want to be a billionaire, you need to do something in generally that affects, that does good things for a billion people. You need to do a lot of good things for a lot of people if you want to make real money. Now, another thing we've learned is, is the way you make money is you find something to sell that to others that they will pay you for. Occasionally, uh, we'll see a homeless person and I think, oh, that's too bad. That guy doesn't have anything to sell that somebody's willing to pay them for. Because if you, if you get someone something that, that you can sell that people will pay you for, you, you, you're out of that situation. So, so, so the key is uh, having something that you can sell that people will pay you for. Uh, and there's lots of things you can sell and lots of things you can do. There is no single path to success. We have known billionaires who've made money so many different ways. That, With so, so many different personalities. But there, so there's no single path to success, but there are characteristics that these successful people have. Uh, have. So let's talk about uh, some of the habits that successful people have. Um, and they, they have habits that help them find things that they can sell. We're talking about the homeless person who, who finds something they can sell. And they also have habits that help them sell it. They're good at selling it. So let's talk about some habits that help people find things that they can sell. And, sell. and we, we like to Martha and I make a living out of putting hokey words together. So one of the words we put together about habits that uh, that help you find things you can sell are play, P-L-A-Y. And the P stands for, and we've talked about it for us, you have a passion. And when you have a passion, you work harder and longer at things and you persist through difficulties. So uh, the P stands for people who have a passion. And, and people who are successful are people who have a passion. And the L stands for lots of interests. The, the people we have hung around with who are, are billionaires, we used to hang around with Ray Dolby a lot, and he was just interested in everything, just lots of interests, and he went into them deeply. And, and the other thing is because he went into interest deeply, he was always learning. So the A stands for always learning. And so Ray uh, and, and, and the other folks we know who are billionaires are always learning. They're just deeply involved in things. And then the why, this is really getting strained. The why is yet again, because they circle back and do all of this as a habit. They continuously do all of this as a habit, so it's yet again. So the, to, the, the habits that help you find things that you can sell are play. Passion, lots of interest, always learning, and yet again, they learn about the world and they learn about problems that they can solve in the world. So play so is- So that they can do good things for So other they can people. do good things for other people, okay. All right. Now, um, so play, we think, is the most important consideration in getting ahead. So, so think about playing as a way to develop your, your passions, uh, your interests, and, and, and learning things in depth. All of this is playing for them. I mean, they, they're just engaged in life and right. fun and learning and just, just it's, it's all play for them. Now, here's another way to look at that. And think about life as a game of Scrabble. And to win, you have to accumulate Scrabble letters. Every area of knowledge, where you know more than other people do is a Scrabble letter 
for you, something in, in your toolbox, on your rack of letters, if you will, that you can use. And to win, you need to accumulate Scrabble letters. And the whole idea of using the PLAY acronym is to give more Scrabble letters things that you know more about than other people do. Let me give you an example using our story of a, our story in Scrabble letters. First of all, aviation was our first passion. But a passion for aviation in and of itself doesn't do a lot of good for you, doesn't make you a lot of money. Uh, you get your pilot certificate and get a commercial, you can do some flying, but, but it's owning your job. You don't, it, it doesn't have scale. It's, so, it's so not really a business. Is a, aviation is our first Scrabble letter. And just like the game of Scrabble, one letter doesn't do anything for you. You have to com combine those letters with something else. Right, so our second Scrabble letter was teaching. John and I found that we really enjoyed teaching and we were teaching these two day ground school live classes, uh, but we were doing relatively small classes, uh, two day weekend classes and we'd have, um, a small class would be 10 or 15 people. A really good class would be uh, 50 or 60 people. But when but, you combine, now you've got a word. You've got two letters. You can do something it, with it. It's a business. So, it was a small business, yeah. but it was a business. Well, we owned our own jobs, basically. But but as soon as, soon as we started uh, teaching, we could do something with our aviation. Right. But we could do a lot more with it once we learned and got good at direct mail. Because with direct mail, that's what let us do uh, classes that were not just five and 10 like we'd been doing around our local uh, FBOs in San Diego, but have large ground, <coughs> ground school classes, the ones with 50, 60, 70, uh, sometimes more classes by, by doing good direct mail pieces to pilots in the area. So we became students of direct mail, and that let us multiply the same teaching now over as many as 100 people. And, and what we would do is we started teaching two-day uh, weekend ground schools. And the idea was, of course, it used to take six or seven weeks to attend a ground school. Well, we said, look, we'll promise you that we will get this done in a weekend for you, one weekend. And so you come into this hotel, we're going to rent a classroom there, and we're going to teach a weekend ground school. Mar Martha would teach the instrument and instrument instructor in one classroom, and I would teach the, uh, the uh, private and commercial and flight instructor in another classroom, and we would do it in a weekend. And, and so we learned to send these direct mailings out, and the people would meet us in these uh, hotel rooms. And we chose places uh, all around the country where they, there were lots of pilots but not many services. For instance, we were in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Billings, Montana, Fargo, North Dakota, uh, Spokane, Washington, places with Boise, lots of pilots, Idaho. Boise, Idaho, lots of pilots, but not many services. And so now we're teaching 50 to 100 people every weekend. If we only had 50, we'd be disappointed. But it still basically required our personal presence there. So we became good at video. We, we started out doing video for instructors to use in our behalf when they went out and taught the class and were able to transfer that into a consumer product. And now we had a product that we could ship out. We could put ourselves in a little box, if you will, and ship ourselves out to people all over the country that uh, couldn't make it to our classes because we weren't close to them or they didn't have uh, the time at, uh, available to spend at that time. We'd teach them on the kitchen table. We'd teach them in their living rooms. So we wound up teaching people right where they live. And that was our another, another uh, Scrabble letter for us. The video let us just scale ourselves and multiply ourselves all over the place. And during that time period, we wound up teaching, we had records from the FAA, we wound up teaching half the pilots in the country learning to fly. We taught generations of pilots because we learned to scale ourselves on video. And, and we had learned direct mail because those who, we had to have all of this. We had right. to have aviation, we had to have teaching, we had to have direct mail, and I had to have video, and those were our Scrabble letters.
John said earlier that we stayed up with technology was one of the reasons why we were successful. And so we took the video and we, uh, when we got the ability with uh, computers, we made it into a computer program that combined uh, the video with questions and uh, explanations and answers and made it a complete computerized learning program which made it much easier for learners to study and remember rather than just watching a, a two hour long videotape that was cut into smaller pieces with lots of questions interspersed and all on the computer. Uh, so that was another Scrabble letter that we had. With the computerized learning, uh, then they, the computer kept track of their progress, served them video for, we'll say, eight, 15 minutes, and then uh, asked them questions, kept track of how they did, gave them explanations, and, uh, and the computer just managed their learning for them and, and just made it a lot easier for them. So that, again, was another Scrabble letter. Um, and then we moved uh, the pro at that point the programs were delivered first on CD-ROM and then on DVDs and then we moved everything online to the internet which made the learning mobile for people and uh, even easier because they could either use a computer at home or they could use a, an iPad or other tablet and take it out with them uh, to the beach or on an airliner and study basically uh, anywhere. And along with the whole internet uh, progression in terms of getting our courses on the internet, we worked very hard to become good at internet marketing. And that made it much easier for our customers to find us, to contact us, uh, to buy from us. And, um, uh, a, a great program for us as far as being able to connect with uh, people who would like to be to learn to fly. So these are, we're, we're, we're hoping to get more Scrabble letters as time goes on. Um, Martha's, a, Martha's a good learner. Um, so let's go back and look at those for just a second. Um, uh, and, but you can see that we accumulated all of these Scrabble letters and each one played against all of the other and it pretty soon made a pretty big word. But that's how, with all of the entrepreneurs that we followed and that we knew about, they learned, 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 and got these Scrabble letters, and they played them together, and they all worked off of each other. And, and uh, it, it, it helped them make a tremendous contribution to society. And the biggest thing that, that I saw about all of these billionaires when they worked with them is they made tremendous contributions they just they they made life better for a lot of people yes uh, when when um we, we flew with ray dolby we went on vacations together we did lots yes, of things of course dolby stereo Do, yeah, Do, yeah dolby noise reduction and we weren't even aware he was a billionaire till after he died and we attended his memorial service and found out all the places in the world that he made music much more pleasurable to people. Symphonies, rock bands, and these groups were all there to celebrate the wonderful life of Ray Dolby and the contributions he had made because he had uh, accumulated Scrabble letters and was able to make a contribution. And he, he had a very rich life and so did the people he came in contact. Your first Scrabble letter, or one of your main ones, I would assume is your passion for aviation. Now you may already have a bunch of additional Scrabble letters, or maybe you still need to work on acquiring them. But the more Scrabble letters you have, the more words you can make in Scrabble, the more you can accomplish in business and in your life and in where you want to go. So play helps you get Scrabble letters and and those Scrabble letters help you find things that you can do for people. And that's the whole key to it, is you find good things you can do for people. Now, here's another word that Martha and I love these hokey words. Uh, here's another word that helps you sell, and that's the dynamite tool, not really a word, dynamite tool of TNT. Well, TNT is a word. Well, I, I suppose it's a word, okay. And the first T, stands for trust. And, and in, if you want to accomplish anything through other people, 
you're going to have to be trustworthy. And you trust someone who has your interest at heart, is, respects you, and is predictable and plays by fair rules. So one of the things that you have to decide that you want to do is become a trustworthy person. And then, then you can begin to sell things to people. Now, the e N, or was for TNT, the N stands for need. And the, what you need to do is seek to understand rather than be understood. Uh, you're seeking out the needs of other people. So you spend your whole life trying to understand other people and their needs. And, and that's the end that you're, uh, you're going to uh, use to satisfy the end for need. Uh, and, and we think about, uh, you're always thinking about with them. And with them, you might not be familiar with with them, but with them is what's in it for me. And it's what the other person is thinking. So you're going through life realizing that the other person is thinking, what's in it for me? Why should I do this? And so uh, if you become oriented in the what's in it for me for other people and you spend your life thinking of their needs, you're much more likely to find needs and much more likely to be able to sell things to them. You have to do something for someone else, uh, whether it's employees or uh, your own customers, because employers won't hire you if you don't do something for them. And if you're in business, customers won't buy from you unless your business does something for them. So you need to find out what those needs are and figure out a solution. And that's how you triumph, that's the second T in TNT, by providing solutions to people's needs. Figure out how you can help them solve a problem that they've got, and that solution will help you triumph. Now, we suggest that you set some goals to go along the line here. And it, it may be a little bit early in this conversation for you to decide exactly what you want to do with the rest of your life. But you can decide right now to decide what kind of person you want to be. And, and what we're suggesting is, is another goal is you, you're a person who has a habit of learning deeply. And we suggest you get a, a passion every year. Just always be pursuing a passion and always be pursuing new ones. And, and also develop at least one way each year that you can use TNT in the area of your passion. So, so have that habit of learning deeply, get a new passion every year, and figure out how to use that passion, how to use TNT, trust, need, and triumph in the area of your passion. Now, when we started this evening, we made some promises. And one promise we made is the single most important consideration in getting ahead and what's the single most important consideration in getting ahead? It's play. Have passion, lots of interest, always be learning, and just repeat it yet again, over and over. Make it a habit, something that you do all the time. And our second promise was the dynamite tool that gets results from people every time. Well, what do you do to get results from, uh, for other, from other people? You use a dynamite tool of TNT. You're trustworthy. You seek out other people's needs, and you triumph with solutions to those needs. So remember, to get ahead, use play and use TNT to help guide you towards the goals you're trying to achieve. And you'll have a lot more fun. And we do. if you do that, folks, we think you'll see how fun leads to success. And folks, thank you very much for putting up with both of us. And we're going to pass it now back to Brian and see uh, what Brian's got on tap. Well, thank you so much for that presentation, John and Martha. We certainly do appreciate it. And uh, your, your fun-loving uh, banter back and forth always, uh, <laughs> always certainly um makes absolutely every presentation you could be telling me about tree bark and i'd find it interesting you guys are, you guys are awesome well, tree bark can be an interesting subject you know well that, that is true i uh, uh there's some there's some trees that were cut down on my block here in the city of chicago yesterday my dog found it interesting and i found it interesting too. a lot of history in that tree <laughs> That's he right. may or may not have peed on it to show his excitement but i just looked at it at least <laughs> well, did you pee on um, <laughs> well, well, that's uh, it's too early to talk about that conversation now, and uh, maybe a little later. <laughs> um, 
So thank you so much for that. And I'm sure we have lots of attendees here with us. And I know a couple of them would probably have some questions for you. Um, and some may just want to say hello. So we're going to shoot into our question and answer portion of this. Um, so like I told everyone before how the question and answer works, if you look at the very bottom of your screen, you'll see a couple options. One will say raise your hand and one will uh, be the chat function. Um, if you would like to ask your question live in real time to John and Martha, you can do that by hitting the raise your hand button right now. Um, we will monitor that. Um, and we will call you out by name um, and our moderator, Luke, who's up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He's our operations manager for NGPA. Um, he will unmute your audio on your computer um, and you'll be able to ask your question in real time. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, maybe a little shy and you want to uh, not speak uh, live on the webinar here, you can just uh, type in your question in the chat function which is down below and we'll ask it for you with John and Martha uh, going forward. Um, the first person that we are gonna go to is uh, the person that we all need to say thank you to uh, for making the introduction uh, of NGPA to John and Martha. So let's go to one of uh, our uh, most beloved ladies uh, within the NGPA and that's uh, Kit Warfield. She'd yeah, like to say we know so Kit, over to you. <laughs> so good. So good to see you both. Well, good and, to see you, Kit. You're, and, and thank you so thank you so life. much again. Thank you so much again for everything that you do. Um, I I'll keep it short. Um, thank you for always uh, clarify, simplify, and make it fun. I always well, remember thank you. that. <laughs> um, thanks for some very memorable times in that famous citation and uh, the helicopter. I really appreciate that too. I can't carry those hours forward in my logbook. Um, you know, all 1.5 or whatever. Um, and just a quick question. Do you feel right now like you're back in the early days um, of your work because you're working from home? <laughs> <laughs> well, and our first videos were done at home. And, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. Actually, uh, uh, we've got uh, 50 employees at King Schools now working at home. And we've set it up so everybody's working at home. And uh, we're doing a lot of uh, virtual meetings by Microsoft Teams. Um, and uh, uh, actually, we're working at least as hard as when we're going to the office because <laughs> it, 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 the work never goes away from the, the work is a little bit different. What we're doing right now is we're getting ahead on scripts and on preparation because we're not coming together in person, which you have to do in order to, to shoot a video. You need to be, all be in the studio there in control room together. But we're right, getting right. a lot of scripts uh, stacked up and the graphics and the animations and the videos, uh, background videos for them, uh, so uh, selected so that we'll, uh, once things get a little bit more normal and uh, the stay at home orders um, uh, get removed, we'll be able to hit the uh, ground running as far as the studio is concerned. Good. Well, thank you both again. And um, I will turn it over to my other colleagues. Well, good, good to talk with you, Kit. We, we've missed you. Good to talk with you. Likewise. Well, thank you, Kit. And of course, thank you for making that connection. For those of you who don't know who are joining us here on the webinar, that voice you just heard uh, from Kit Warfield, she was uh, a voice that maybe many of you have heard many times um, in your aviation past as she was one of the voices on Microsoft Flight Simulator's training videos. So Kit was very instrumental along with the Kings in putting together uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator training videos. And uh, Kit worked for Microsoft and she was actually the voice uh, that you heard um, across the Microsoft Flight Simulator training uh, sequence. So that's a pretty cool fact. And she was the former co-chair of the board of directors here for the NGPA. So thank you, Kit. Um, anyone else who wants to raise their hand, feel free to hit the raise your hand button. Don't be shy. You can go ahead and ask your questions. We have some questions that are coming through right now um, in our chat box here. So I'm going to go with uh, the first one here. This is from uh, Dylan, and I, I apologize, Dylan, if I pronounce your last name wrong, Gail. I'm gonna go with Dylan Gale. Um, he's asked, John and Martha, could you give some examples of how some of your non-aviation passions have helped your aviation business? Well, direct marketing is one, video is one, or all non-aviation passions. Uh, um, the technology involved in um, uh, getting into the software part of the programs, uh, when John and I uh, were in, in graduate school together, 
we um, we did some programming. Boy, that was were the languages I'm going to name. Fortran, most of you will yeah, never have yeah, heard of yeah. Fortran and and uh, Basic. Um, got us involved enough and enjoying enough uh, software writing and understanding the logic and the flow that that although we're we're no ways competent to to write the programming now, we understand the concepts and the flow, and we um, we have a feel for what can be done easily and what's going to be difficult to do, and um, uh, that has helped an awful lot. Yes, uh, getting just having an interest in computers has, has yes. been. I, I just think uh, I really believe that software is going to be the future of the world. It's a, it's a so just a use of the brain. And, uh, and and programming computers and now now we're doing things like uh, like uber and lyft and uh, and we took what we did is we took iphones that were around we took gps that was around and cars were around put those all three together and made a business out of it that's they, they, that was a, our friend at an airport we, we get uh, people pick us up and take us where we need to go and it's it's worked just wonderfully for us. So if you do a lot of a lot of flying and traveling around to different airports, uh, Uber and Lyft are just wonderful. And, yeah. and, and it's a combining of Scrabble letters to make those hats. They were had all existed, but then people put them together in a whole and and uh, they, they became very powerful tools. Something else that, that kind of plays into that, um, uh, John's uh, undergraduate degree is in accounting and mine is in oddly enough, comparative literature. And you can say his, his accounting degree was very helpful in terms of when we were getting our business set up, understanding what we needed to do and um, uh, how to know when we were making money and, and the things we needed to do to grow the business. You would look at that, what we were doing and say, well, what is it, uh, what good is a comparative literature degree in those kinds of circumstances? But we do an enormous amount of writing. We write scripts, we write marketing materials, uh, we write articles like uh, the column that we share in Flying Magazine. And the, my degree in comparative literature, although not directly attached in any way to aviation, has been an enormous help in terms of uh, good scripts, good articles, good marketing materials, and so on. She's so, trying to teach me how to read and write and talk. And, um, it's tough. Yeah. It's tough. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, Dylan did type a message. He said, thank you so much for addressing his question. So he All appreciates right. it, and so do we. Um, we have a couple of uh, folks who want to ask some live questions here. So uh, next, we're going to go to uh, Mike Nichols. Mike, you should be... Uh, unmuted now, and you can go ahead with your question, Mike, for John and Martha. Hello, good buddy. Hello. How are you doing? How are you doing, Mike? Hey, John and Martha. It's so nice to see you. Thank you very much for taking time uh, to be with us, and I'm glad that you both are doing really well. Uh, I was curious about your perspective on workforce development, which, as you know, is one of the highest priorities for the broad aviation industry over the past several years. How do you see the impact of COVID-19 on flight training and career opportunities for young people who are pursuing professional flying careers? Well, I, we certainly didn't see COVID-19 coming, so I'm not very good at predicting anything about that. Mark, do you have a comment? Well, it, 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 as I'm not the first one to say this, but as, as other people have said, the pilot shortage was a long time coming, and it's real, and it's not going to be going as gangbusters as it was for at least a couple of years, but... Um, it's not going to go away because there's an awful lot of retirement still uh, in the major airlines. And so it's going to, the demand is going to be there. And frankly, particularly in the business aviation area, because I was reading this morning that while airlines are doing, what, 5% of the flight activity they used to be doing, particularly if they're international, um, General aviation, particularly with the turboprops, the turboprops in general aviation are already back up to about 50% of the 
flight level that they were a couple of months ago. Now that's not where we all want to be, but that's an awful lot better than where the airlines are. And I think there's going to be a, a big job opportunity in business aviation. We just need to get smarter about letting people know that we exist. Uh, aviation maintenance is another area that um, uh, we're just bringing our airplane out of a big inspection and uh, uh, the, the things that they're doing and, and taking care of for us are the only reason we're able to fly the aircraft. And it's a, um, the, we, we're, we're going to have a big need for uh, maintenance folks as we go through the years. Uh, we, and not that we know what the hell we're talking about, because if we knew what we were talking about, we would have uh, made a lot of money in advance on COVID-19. Thank you. I think you're exactly right. Well, thank you, Mike. And uh, Mike, I'm sorry I'm not going to get to see you at uh, eBase this year. I know that that's a, uh, a sad thing that everyone's missing out. But thanks so much for your question, Mike, and hopefully I'll see you at one of our next events soon. Um, all right. I'm going to – you have a couple of messages of thanks, so, so I'm going to read some of these out. This is from Cecilia Adams, and she just said, thank you so very much, John and Martha. Very powerful information, and I'm so very thankful for the lessons you give. I plan to play and play and play. <laughs> uh, Go for it. Go for it. Good. That's great. Um, and Steve Jensen says, thanks, John and Martha. Your CDs uh, helped to teach me fly back in 1999. Appreciate your support of the NGPA and your many contributions to aviation. So that's the, Steve These Jensen. are names that keeps coming back. Jim Hackman, I saw his name flash by earlier there. Uh, yeah, Jim's got a question. I'm going to get to Jim in just a second. All We've right. got a couple folks who do have their hands raised. Uh, okay. Right now, we're going to go to John uh, Speranza. John Speranza has his hand raised. John, you should be unmuted now, and you're uh, welcome to talk here to John and Martha. Go right ahead. Thanks, Brian. Uh, John and Martha, I just want to uh, express my personal appreciation for the impact uh, that you've made on my own uh, career and my flight training. There's no way I would have passed my CFI checkride without your, uh, your checkride course DVD. Um, I also want to further express my thank you for the work you've done on the ACS. Um, so I, my personal story is I was an airline pilot. And I was really fortunate to have collected a lot of those Scrabble words. Um, I, I ended up quitting that a number of years back to go back to teach flying. And so your, your story really resonated with me. Um, I'm curious, I do have a, a quick question and I'm curious what, what you think the future of flight training looks like and, and how you at King Schools are, are adapting to, to serve your customers and students in the future. Uh, John, I'm going to give kind of a self-serving answer. I think the secret of life is that you do good things for people. And, and it's a great, great privilege to have played a role in the lives of people who are learning to fly. It's just a tremendous privilege. And, and I believe that uh, the future of flight training it goes hand in hand with the future of flying. And, uh, and, and as flying becomes, uh, is persists and becomes more uh, complex, um, uh, we're going to have a big need for flight training in the future. I, I really believe so. The international flying, I think, is going to have um, a slow restart, much slower than domestic. But um, people who have traveled the world for business and pleasure are not going to be very happy about giving it up. It, it will take them a little bit of time particularly internationally, to get comfortable again with, with a lot of traveling, but it will happen. So I'm thinking um, that, the, that within two years, maybe three at the most, uh, that, that the aviation activity is going to be uh, back up as good as it was before. Yeah. And, you know, uh, aviation does so much for people. Right. Uh, it it, it, it uh, lets us understand and travel the world, and, and it takes us to different places. It, it's, it's almost the ultimate expression of freedom, and uh, we're not going to give that up. As, there, as a community, we're not going to There is that. a fabulous uh, program, uh, movie, Living in the Age of Airplanes, and it's not about pilots. It's about what airplanes do for people. It's about the, the flowers that are uh, put on an airplane in Nairobi, Kenya, and end up in Holland uh, at a flower market. And, end and then up, go to Anchorage. And, and then go to Anchorage, Alaska, and are delivered uh, by a husband to his wife uh, for their anniversary uh, the next day. 
and we're, we're used have, to an we're, awful we're, lot of this kind of thing and 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 i don't think people are going to give it up uh, they're going to want to continue that we had a, a fabulous dinner in a house in wichita kansas in which the things in that dinner, fruits and vegetables, had come from all over the world. And I'm, and I'm thinking, this is Wichita, Kansas. It is amazing. And we have a system that ties us all together and the products of the world all together. That's why we're vulnerable to, uh, uh, to, the, to, to the virus, to the pand uh, mm -hmm. uh, pandemic. But I think we'll get smarter about it. Well, I hope we, I hope we will. And, and I hope we get vaccines also. Well, thank you both so much for your response. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Brian. Right. Thank, thanks, John, for your question. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, now, another question that we got on the uh, chat message here. This comes from Kathy Hamilton. Um, she just said thank you to the both of you again. And she wanted to know uh, what you can tell her about drones. She has some interest um, in drones and any suggestions in getting involved in, uh, in the droning area. I know Kathy personally, and I know that she flies for Horizon Air um out in uh, the pacific northwest so uh just some interest in droning and anything that maybe you can share uh, for someone dabbling in that well it, 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 interesting uh, drones do a wonderful job to me to explaining an important concept and the important concept is all innovation in retrospect seems obvious and you look at drones and these four uh propellers and supporting us thing and you think, well, what's the big deal? But no one did it until then. And then drones allowed photography, uh, some beautiful, beautiful shots of houses, bays, beaches. Drones just allow spectacular photography, far cheaper than flying in a helicopter. And if you look at it, it, it seems obvious in retrospect. So mm -hmm. all innovation seems obvious in retrospect, and drones taught me that. But I think drones are just, just, Wonderful. I mean, it, we, we as a public, we have both a fear and a fascination of the third dimension. So we're all looking at this third dimension, and drones scare people. And and so, uh, but they can also do so much for people. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they've been using them in a lot of places to fly medicines, to fly um, um, uh, COVID test kits from where the uh, the, the test was taken to labs where they can be uh, analyzed. Uh, depending on where they're being used, uh, they're a tremendous benefit and a tremendous um, speed up of, um, uh, uh, particularly in the health field. One of the things that the Helicopter Association International has done very, very wisely is they've embraced drones. And what a, what a smart move that is on their part. And uh, drones are gonna be here to stay because it's just such a, such a fabulous improvement it's just the combination it's 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 uh, drones are came about because of scrabble letters because it's taking a computer uh, a, a gps and 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 putting those little motors and, and those little motors and propellers and putting them together and doing something that we couldn't do before and that's and and, and uh, put all of this together um in, in scrabble letters and, and computers it's just it's just a Great combination of scrabble letters. Awesome, thanks John and Martha for uh, uh, talking about drones there for Kathy. Um, this is a message which in our chat window as well that comes to us from uh, Ashutosh Mishra all the way from India. He says, thank you so much uh, for making the presentation at 3 a.m. here in India, but I stayed up to uh, make sure that I could watch you all. <laughs> thank um, you, and, I'm sorry to keep you away. Uh, <laughs> well, I think he was excited to stay awake for all of this. Um, uh, Ashtosh is actually, uh, he said he's an electrical engineer and he's worked on product, uh, I'm sorry, project management as well, but he's interested in making the switch and being, um, uh, being one of the first LGBTQ pilots in India to rise through the ranks from one, um, from one industry into the aviation industry, um, but he's realizing that the cost of doing so is so high. So his question is, how would you suggest someone to start from basically zero and uh, make it all the way to a career in aviation um, when cost is such a great barrier? What would be your recommendations for starting out? Well, um, uh, again, I, I, I'm gonna, I don't know what I'm talking about. That's, uh, that's gonna be no barrier to me. Um, I should go into politics. But uh, uh, I, I believe that there's, the, the, that 
uh, ground, ground learning uh, is a whole lot cheaper than air learning. And um, I, the, the more you can learn before you get into the air, the better off you are. And I just think you just can't, can't, can't learn too much uh, uh, with ground schools and, 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 and studying. And I, I just think that uh, knowledge, is, knowledge is the key to the world. It's key to everything. And also uh, a, a, a display of dedication and motivation goes a long way. And we know people who have um, maybe made a start in aviation or, or not even gotten quite that far yet, who have been hanging around the airport and working to do things to help solve needs for people who have airplanes, maybe for flight schools, for um, uh, aircraft management companies who need someone maybe just starting as a gopher, uh, where they are there and around airplanes and around pilots and, and aircraft managers uh, on a regular basis and have the opportunity to, to find needs and help fill needs and show, uh, show their passion and how much it means to them. And the industry is, the community is really very warm and close-knit and supportive for people who, who clearly show that they have a passion. The TNT is a, a powerful, powerful tool to advance you and just about anything. When you seek out, um, you're trustworthy, you seek out other people's needs, and you're thinking about what you can do for other people, it's a powerful tool. And I, I think you hit the nail on the head right there. I mean, passion can take anyone uh, who, who might see adversity to getting to the end game goal and it can drive you uh, directly to where you want to be. Um, if you have a passion and a fire behind what your dream is, uh, Ashtosh, then uh, you're going to make it to exactly where you want to be, no matter the adversity in terms of the financial restraint and getting you there. Um, and there's tons of opportunities and there's tons of things out there that you can uh, uh, that you can pull on uh, different scholarship opportunities and whatnot, and I think this is a great plug for our NGPA uh, our NGPA scholarships, which will be opening up our scholarship window on June fifteenth of this year. Uh, they are open to international students as well. The only restriction for us is you need to be an NGPA member. Um, so do double check our NGPA website, www.ngpa.org forward slash scholarships. And you can check out all the different scholarships that we have uh, on offer uh, for our 2020 scholarship cycle, where we'll be offering over $100,000 worth of aviation scholarships, even in the current situation with COVID-19, we are still able to offer that this year. And something that great, great. Great. just to plug there. Wonderful. Um, all right, another live question. We're going to keep the distance uh, going here for, I know where this person's coming to us from. We're going to go down under right now to one of our members from NGPA Australia, uh, and that's Jasmine Bly. So Jasmine, you should be unmuted. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, and go ahead with your question. Thank you very much, Brian. I just want to say, uh, John and Martha, thank you very much. It was actually from Flight Simulator 2002 that actually ignited my passion in aviation not just as a pilot but also as an AMP mechanic and has led me to have a fascinating career within the industry so i just want to say a big thank you very much cost you a lot of money um, didn't we the only question i want to ask <sighs> you absolutely did <laughs> go ahead jasmine Stop. the only question i want to ask that's I'm sorry. Another question I want to ask is that with the uh, TNT, you talk about um, being sort of trustworthy and, uh, and I guess uh, having trust in those people. Have there been any times in which you would, um, I guess, I guess the question I'm trying to ask is, uh, how would you go, I guess, about trusting people and, I, and, and how would you know, I guess, in starting up of, who to trust and um, I guess what are some of the tools that you would use to I guess to gain trust from people and to also trust other people? Well the the, the biggest thing that, that we're using with the T for is to be trustworthy that 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 we ourselves be trustworthy um, and you do make yourself vulnerable when you become trustworthy and you're seeking out other people's needs you do become vulnerable and vulnerability is part of it and uh, if you refuse to make yourself vulnerable 
uh, it's it you put yourself at a disadvantage in the long run. But but that is that is a problem. And of course, we've been hurt by people. Um, we've all been hurt by people. Um, and and the, the bit about learning who to trust, um, you know, which other people out there to trust is really a, a core part of living life. Um, and as John says, we're trying to uh, address the issue of making sure that you yourself are the kind of person that that other people that other trust. people will trust and can trust because and should make trust. and yeah. should trust it makes a huge difference in whether they're willing to help you on your way to to your goals yeah, so um, uh, I, I think the key the, the the most important thing you do get hurt uh, but the most important thing is to be trustworthy and uh, and 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 I, I, we we uh, at King Schools we have core values. One of our core values is that everyone wants to have and should have is entitled to uh, meaningful and rewarding work in an atmosphere of civility and respect. And and sometimes we find uh, that uh, that we have to enforce that civility and, and, and respect across the board. And um, but sometimes we have customers who. Um, uh, are not civil and respectful to the folks working at King Schools. And I think we, we have an obligation to disallow uh, that disrespectfulness. If people can't be civil and respectful to, uh, to our, our people, we, 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 we can't ask them to, uh, to be in that situation where they can't trust other people. Uh, I was a, that was a very confused uh, answer because I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> no, that was a fantastic answer. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jasmine, for your question. Hope everything's going uh, going well down in Australia, and I look forward to seeing you on our next Zoom conversation. Um, we talked about Jim Hackman before, John and Martha, and Jim Hackman um, did put in um, something. He wanted you to comment, I guess, on how you can uh, surpass competition when you're in a type of business and the things that you can do to surpass competition. He specifically said, uh, can you comment on how um, you worked uh, in competing with Jeppesen, uh, which was a longtime supplier uh, for training materials to Cessna? Um, that, 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 that's what he mentioned. I'm, I'm surmising that from his question there is uh, the best way to tackle competition. That's because of Jim's background. He's familiar right. with it. Uh, well, it goes back to uh, part of uh, Kit's closing comment, which was clarify, simplify, and make it fun. We have a vision that ties in with passion, with making learning to fly a fun proposition, um, with with making every aspect of it playful so that because we feel that people learn better and remember better if they have fun learning something and we've drawn a little bit of flack once in a while from a long time professional airline pilots who came out of the military uh, not ones that came up through ga who say um uh, you're being too flip about this whole thing because flying is serious business and you need to make sure that uh, the people you teach take it seriously. But the point is, the best way to make people take it seriously is to make sure that they learn and remember the, the points that you're trying to, to teach them. <coughs> and, and humor and playfulness goes a long way towards doing that. Um, when we started doing the two-day ground schools and later on the, the courses on, on video, CD, VHS first, then uh, CD and, and uh, DVDs, there were a number of flight schools that taught uh, ground schools, but they didn't generally do a two-day ground school. They would do like a eight or 10 week ground school and you come one or two nights a week. And sometimes the ground schools were free and free is a very hard price to compete with. So what you have to do is you have to figure out, okay, uh, in our case, um, Jefferson is the big professional guy. 
were the little mom and pop, hey, we're, we love general aviation just like you do, uh, look our customer in the eye, be, be fun, be humorous, uh, be shareable, and have, have a unique selling proposition that makes you different than your competition. And our unique selling proposition is to be authentic, uh, an authentic mom and pop. Um, because we are really a little tiny operation. We're just John and Martha, and we want to be who we genuinely are. And our, our goal is to do a better job of connecting uh, with, with the pilots who are learning and taking care of their needs. It's a little bit of, of the TNT stuff, that we really understand their needs and do a better job. And when this little mom and pop operation is going to be able to do a better job of connecting with the pilot's needs than Jefferson is going to be, or any big company. But because we're, we're living and breathing it. We're going to go out to this, week, this weekend, get an airplane and fly it. And uh, so we're, we're, we're authentically mom and pop. And a better job than almost any instructor teaching a ground school at an FBO because the ground school is what we do, uh, what we specialize in, what we do for a living. And the instructor doing an evening ground school at an FBO would really rather be in an airplane uh, and keeping up on uh, techniques with the airplane rather than uh, trying to stay up with all the reg and airmen's in, in, uh, uh, Airman's Information Manual changes. Jim, thank you very much for the question. You gave me this opportunity to, to, to be our self-serving here. But, but if someone takes one of our courses and says, well, that wasn't so difficult. What's the big deal about that? That was kind of fun. We've done our job. Because our job is to take relatively uh, complicated stuff, clarify it, simplify it, and make it fun. So when they get done, we hope they say, well, I don't understand what the big deal was. That was, I, I, I got it, I understand it, it was fun. Then we've done our job. And one and of the problems, damn, and go ahead. I was gonna say, you do a damn good job of it as well, making it fun, so. Well, one of the downsides of our, your unique selling proposition is to clarify and simplify and make it fun. No one gives you any credit for being intelligent. You don't, you don't, you, 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 you seem simple because you made a job of making it simple. And so people think of you, oh, geez, they're just kind of hokey. And we are hokey because that's how we help people remember stuff. Uh, we know that we're about an hour and 15 minutes in now. One more live question, and then we'll call it quits for the day. So thank <laughs> you so much for giving up your time to us. Uh, right now, we're going to go to our last live question, and that's going to be Matthew Walker. So Matthew, uh, you should be unmuted now, and you can go ahead with your question for John and Martha. Okay, great. Can you all hear me? We yeah. can. Okay, great. So first of all, I just want to thank you all for everything that you've done for aviation. Uh, I've used all of your Cessna programs and I always read all of your pieces in Flying Magazine and I just love the voice that you all bring to aviation. Um, I came into the seminar a little bit late. I was taking a, an accounting final. I did make an A, so I'm happy about that. Um, <laughs> oh, that's good. If you've covered if you've uh, covered my question already, I apologize for that. Um, I am currently working on my commercial writing, and I work at a small airport here in central Kentucky. And I'm curious if you know of anything that I can be doing right now to make myself uh, more attractive to hiring managers. Um, I'm open to working about just about in any area in flying. I'm also getting an airport management degree on the side, too. Um, anything I can be doing right now to really make myself a quality candidate. And uh, then, Mr. John, I've got a question for you. Um, I've read a lot about your uh, battles with the FAA uh, in the medical sphere. And I'm just wondering what kind of progress you might be seeing on the horizon when it comes to that. Well, um, uh, I'll, I'll take, take the second one first. Uh, we're, we're hoping that they can... Uh, be more kind to people and uh, more considerate of the impact they have on other people. And we're working on that and we're working on it at a, at a pretty high level. But one of, the, one of the biggest things that discourages people from becoming a pilot is the investment they make and then they could have it arbitrarily and capriciously taken away from them by the aeromedical certification folks. And so um, people are beginning to see that as a workforce 
um, issue uh, that that it that it, it we, we, detrimental we, to the growth of the uh, to the very essential and needed growth of the aviation workforce. All right. And now, how do you make yourself attractive to to be hired? And the answer is, and I think I, it, here's the key. What's going to make you stand out from anybody else is that you understand the person, the people you want to be hired by. You know who they are, and you go talk to them, and you say, here's why I want to work for your company more than any other company in the world, because what you do matters to me, and you do it well, I respect, I admire you, and I want to work for you, and here's why. And then, then you're more likely to get hired by them. Uh, it's not about you as far as they're concerned, it's about them, and it's about uh, here's why I want to work for you. Here's why you're very, very special. And here's where I think I can make a contribution to the, what you have done so well so far. And if you really can't say that, it's going to be hard for you to go, go get hired by that company because it's, it's not about you. It's about them. And, and you've got to make, a, make it aware, make them aware that you think it's all about them. One of the things that we noticed with uh, particularly one friend that we have that um, when he was graduating, from um, uh, an aviation college uh, talked to us the summer after and was saying, look, I've, I've had these interviews with different companies, some regional airlines, some business uh, aviation companies, uh, uh, and I'm not getting hired. And he says, can you tell me what I'm doing wrong? I, I tell them how hard I'm going to work and how uh, dedicated I'm going to be and how I will just be. I'll take uh, it more seriously than anybody else. And, and our answer was, well, there's the problem. You're not going to be fun to sit next to an airplane. Um, you and so, you so, want to be the kind of person that people will enjoy being in your company whether it's sitting next to you in an airplane cockpit or next to you at a desk uh, in, in a hangar office or wherever it may be. Um, and that goes back in a sense to the TNT. Uh, you wanna be a person who's trustworthy. You wanna be a person who's thinking about their needs and who finds your success in helping them succeed and makes it fun. And, and, and therefore, it should be all about the company that uh, you want to be hired by. And, and if, to the extent, let me, let me explain how you can make it so they have no choice but to hire you. If, if, if you um, uh, go study that company, know what they did five years ago, what they did 10 years ago, and, and can re repeat back to them all their successes and all the wonderful things they've done. And their vision for the future. And their vision for the future. And, it's, and you make it all about them and you come in and tell them that you make it clear that you have very, very seriously studied that company and you respect them and admire them. What choice do they have? They're almost going to have to hire you. Are you still Absolutely. there, Matthew? Yes. Thank you so much. That's all. <laughs> I am. If you, I am, if you can hear me. Yeah. That's yeah, all yeah. really great advice, and I've been jotting it down just as much <laughs> as I could. And I just want to thank you all again, and and thank the uh, NGPA for putting this on too. This has all been really great. Well, nice talking with you, Matthew. Thank you so much, Matthew. And congrats on your A that you got on that uh, on that. Yeah. <laughs> I sure couldn't have done that. Uh, thank you. Um, well, John and Martha, I have a brief closing, unless you yeah. wanted to say anything else to everybody here. Um, I'll jump into my closing. Um, go right ahead, Brian. Right. No, right. go, go well, right uh, on behalf of all of us here at the NGPA and, of course, all of our attendees, we can't thank you enough for uh, continuing to share your love of, Avery, uh, your love of aviation, uh, your inspiration to always be better, and, uh, of course, the encouragement that I know you definitely give me and you give everyone else uh, to add humor to every part of your day <laughs> because that is such a great piece of uh, – great piece of health that you can give to your mental psyche as you go through life, especially now in the situation that we find ourselves in. 
Uh, like I said, at the very start of this, you're both icons in the aviation industry. And we're all so lucky that we've learned so much from you today and also over the past 40 years. And we'll continue to learn from you uh, through, uh, through the, the, uh, the stuff you put out through King Schools, through your appearances at different events. Uh, and of course, just through the conversations um, that so many people are lucky enough to have with you um, as they go on through life. Um, so definitely something that means so much to me is your support of the NGPA. It means so much to our members as well. And we're so happy that we had the opportunity to meet you uh, back in Palm Springs in 2019. And I truly look forward to a continued relationship over the next couple of years. And of course, I want to say thanks to all the attendees who joined us tonight. Thank you so much for spending a part of your day with us. Uh, we hope that you're uh, enjoying the content that the NGPA is bringing to you during this tough time for not only our world, but of course, our beloved aviation industry. Uh, we're going to continue to work on more content that we can bring to you through our COVID-19 webinar series. Um, our next focus, I can tell you, is going to be on the uh, arena of business aviation. And we hope to have some uh, business aviation topics to cover within the next two weeks as another webinar series. So please do uh, keep checking our website. Um, we'll be posting information on our upcoming webinars on our COVID-19 member resource page of NGPA.org. Uh, and we also plan on having a little bit of uh, maybe a non-information session, but an NGPA comedy hour web type webinar that we'll host in the, uh, in the coming weeks as well. Um, for our NGPA members, uh, in this time of social distancing, it doesn't mean that we can't gather. Uh, so be sure to join many of our virtual social hours that are going on regularly. Uh, that's uh, all throughout our worldwide NGPA network. And all those social hours and links to those Zoom socials are posted on our uh, members only section of our COVID-19 member resources page. So be sure to check them out. We actually have two of them going on tonight. NGPA Canada will be hosting one uh, in just about uh, 37 minutes from right now at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And then uh, Windy City Flyers right here in Chicago. You can join me this evening for a, a game of Quiplash as well as uh, some social uh, hangouts with your NGPA family there. Uh, the you last guys, thing that I'll mention is, oh, go ahead, John, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, you're a wonderful organization. Martha and I are proud to be allies. And, and we're so happy to have you as allies here. It, uh, it, it definitely means the world to our members and to us. Um, and if you're on Instagram, John and Martha, and you want to join us, and for anyone else who is listening, uh, Troy Merritt, <laughs> our NGPA vice president and myself, will be having our third NGPA town hall live. Uh, that's going to be this Saturday, uh, May the 9th. It'll be at 3 p.m. Eastern time, and that's going to be via our Instagram platform. Troy and I will give you an update on the NGPA, uh, plans for our future, and uh, some insight onto our future events as well and what our plan is as we head into our fall event in September. Um, for anyone else who wants to join that, you can follow us on Instagram at NGPA2. And for those of you who are not members and want to become a member of the NGPA, www.ngpa.org. Up in the top right, you can click Join Now. Uh, and you can join our growing uh, NGPA family of members that uh, lie all across the world. So John and Martha, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for giving up your time to spend with us and our members and sharing your continued outstanding aviation knowledge with everyone who joined us today. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the great weather in San Diego. Uh, I'm having sun now as you, I have to keep shifting. The sun is moving here in Chicago. This, uh, normally we're used to dreary conditions, but I'll take the sunshine when I can. Um, so thanks so much uh, on behalf of the entire NGPA family. Take care of yourselves and each other out there. Make sure to check in with folks who might be a little bit more isolated than you. And we hope to see you again soon when it's safe to do so at our next NGPA event. Good night, John and Martha. And good night, everybody, for attending. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.